Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to be here again at our sixth webinar. Uh, we are already going toward the end. So after this, we will have other two uh, webinars as well. And as usual, every Thursday uh, at the same time for PM chat. My name is Stefano Gagliotto, and I'm Chief of Sales here in ProGold, and I will be the moderator today. We will have, as usual, a section of about 30, 40 minutes, okay, for the presentation. Um, this time, no, this time it should be a little bit longer, but Valerio told me it should be around 45 minutes. And we have a second part uh, of about uh, 30 minutes reserved to the question that you are free, as usual, to do any time using the Q&A tool that you will find the bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, all the material, video, and presentation are available in our website, progold.com, uh, in the webinar section. The title of today's work is Characterization of the 14K Gold Alloys. Uh, we will talk about chemical and physical properties of 14K yellow, red, and white gold alloys, understanding how, uh, for example, the color can change or why and how an item in 14K can be hardened or no. Uh, last week, we, we talked about the 18 carat. Why this time we will continue the job uh, explaining you and trying to share in, uh, our experience on 14 carat uh, gold alloys. The speaker uh, today is Valerio Doppio. He is graduate in material science. In ProGold, he is responsible for the R&D and the quality uh, control. I think that we can start, as I said all, I can pass the word to Valerio, wishing everybody uh, good listening. So Valerio, you can go, good luck. Thank you, Stefano. So uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone and thank you for your presence. Um, Stefano already did a very good job in introducing this um, presentation. Uh, so this work, uh, which is part of a bigger work uh, we made uh, some year ago for the Santa Fe Symposium, um, had the objective uh, to uh, examine all the mechanical, physical, and chemical characteristics of uh, the alloy we had at our disposal and try to understand uh, how each of these characteristics uh, was uh, uh, influenced by the composition of the alloy. Um, this was uh, to be able uh, when uh, we had a request for a, uh, a particular uh, use or a particular uh, job the alloy had to do, uh, to be able to understand um, quickly what was the ideal composition and whatever we had uh, already this composition in our range or we had to create another one. Um, the as I said, the bigger research uh, in, were comprised both analysis on yellow, red, and white gold. Here, for uh, time reason, we will uh, speak only about, uh, we will present only data about red and yellow gold, but you can uh, find in our uh, publication on the website uh, the complete research if you are interested in it. So, characterization of the alloy. What are the characteristics we took in consideration when um, considering uh, all the data? Uh, we went on uh, into measuring the solidus and liquidus temperatures for every alloy, so the behavior um, in melting, the density of the alloy, uh, the color, I will... Uh, take a little bit of time when we will arrive on that part of the presentation to explain you how uh, color measurement uh, work, and how we, uh, how we uh, organize that part of the work. Um, hardness after thermal treatment, uh, in particular after solubilization and after hardening. Then, in addition, uh, the grain size for each uh, of these alloy, the mechanical characteristics, so ultimate tensile strength, yield strength, and the elongation at the breakpoint, the Ericsson value, again, I will make a brief introduction of what uh, this value represents for uh, the people who doesn't, don't know, 
and the hardness after cold working. Uh, we will um, explain all these uh, characteristics of the alloy for both the yellow and red color in different uh, parts of this presentation. We will start with the yellow gold. So, 14 carat gold alloy. We uh, examined a total of 32 alloys for this section of the work. Uh, clearly, 14 carat, so gold concentration is 58.5%. Uh, uh, to have a um, classical range of yellow color, we have a silver concentration, uh, which varies from 2 to 26.6%, and a zinc concentration, which varies from 0.6 to 10.4%. Uh, Part of these 32 alloys are alloys containing a grain refiner, or better yet, two kinds of grain refiner, which we will call GR1 and GR2. The first one is a, a platinoid group uh, element, while the second one, we will see later what this definition means, is a, a solidus state a grain refiner. Uh, at least um, a part of this 32 alloy will instead contain a deoxidizer element. So no grain refiner, but a deoxidizer element. We begin, like we say before, with the uh, liquidus and solidus uh, uh, analysis. Here in this graph, uh, we represent uh, the, uh, how the liquidus represented by the um, triangle dots and the red line and the solidus, represented by the square dots and the blue line, vary uh, according to the silver concentration inside of the alloy. As you can see, both the liquidus and the solidus temperature tend to decrease while the silver concentration increase. This up until uh, a content of silver around uh, um, 12 to 15% of silver. Uh, for silver concentration um, higher than these values, the uh, temperatures tend both to uh, increase again. So this uh, behavior in the second part of the graph uh, is probably due to the uh, zinc, because uh, to maintain a yellow color, as the silver concentration is increasing, we have to decrease the zinc concentration or the color will become much whiter. From this data, what we can also uh, understand and see is that the melting range, so the difference between the liquidus and the solidus temperature tend to decrease while the silver concentration increase. If we uh, now take the same subset of data, but we eliminate the data uh, corresponding to alloy with uh, more than 8% of zinc. So we try to reduce the zinc influence in this subset of data and uh, see what's the behavior of uh, uh, silver dominating uh, alloys we have a, a graph which is very similar to the previous one. So zinc content tend to, um, the fact that we have less zinc inside of the alloy tend to lower the temperature. Tend to, I'm sorry, I said the opposite of it. The temperature tend to be a little higher because the, the, zinc, the, the alloy tend to contain less zinc but the trend are very similar. Again, we have both the temperature who decrease um, while the silver concentration increase, and again, uh, from around 15% uh, of silver, both the temperature tend to increase again. Uh, between the, sol the liquidus and the solidus temperature, solidus seems the one which, which is more affected by the zinc content, and so between the previous and the current graph, it tends to vary the most. Going on with the density. 
here in this uh, graph we represent the variation of the density uh, depending on the silver concentration. Again, we can see that we have a almost linear correlation between density and silver concentration. Uh, as the silver uh, increase inside of the loy, the density increase too. Uh, if we were to um, take only consider only the data uh, for a loy we have uh, which has the same uh, amount of silver, a different amount of zinc, we will see that the density uh, will decrease as the zinc content increases. So the behavior of the zinc compared to the behavior of the silver is the opposite. Let's go on and talk a little bit about color. So um, what's the uh, a space color? What's the Sielab space color? Um, it's a, a method to represent uh, coloration. Uh, the CLAB is one of uh, many specific uh, color space, uh, the one of the most recent one, and it's uh, uh, used in jewelry because uh, it uh, approximates very well human vision, and in particular, uh, when the uh, human eye is able or not to distinguish from two different uh, but very similar color. And it's also a space which is influenced uh, very few from the measuring device we use. So it's uh, very um, easy to compare results uh, from company to company when they use this kind of uh, color space. It basically describes uh, every possible color with a combination of three coordinates in a 3D dimensional space. We have uh, color coordinate L, color coordinate A, and color coordinate B, uh, which work like in the figure. So L color coordinate represent the brightness. Uh, for a value of zero, uh, we have a black color. For a value of 100, we have a white color. And all the intermediate values clearly are uh, all the grayscale, basically. Uh, the A color represents the hue of uh, the color, varying from green for negative A value to red for positive A um, value. Um, at the same way, uh, B color coordinate represents the blue to yellow hue of the color. So you can see that for every color uh, in existence, we can use a combination of th these three coordinates to describe it in a very objective manner and to go over the differences which can be uh, from perception of human eye and subjectivity. Um, a classical example is uh, um, a Russian red color uh, in Italy is correspond with his, his view uh, as a red, a classical red color, but in Russia uh, it is considered a yellow color. So um, this uh, um, kind of measure and this method of measurement is um, can give us the, the value which are uh, completely objective and not uh, uh, dependent on our uh, culture or subjectivity. So let's go on and see, after having introduced the, the, the color space, how the um, color vary for the yellow 14 karat gold alloys depending on the composition. This graph represents the uh, L color coordinate uh, against the silver concentration. So you can see that uh, um, as the silver concentration increases, the uh, L coordinate tend to increase too. But there is no uh, uh, precise correlation. There is a lot of dispersion on data. Um, and the uh, brightness, so the L coordinate, tends to increase also with the zinc content. So we talk. Um, 
at that time we we tried to to find if there was a combination of uh, uh, silver and zinc which could uh, describe with a better correlation the L variation and this is what we found if we try to represent the same set of data uh, against the silver plus double the zinc concentration we obtain a very good uh, correlation and uh, as you can see the trend is better described which means that both the silver and the zinc have an effect into increasing the L coordinate but uh, also uh, give us a measure of uh, the um, strength of each of the elements. In particular we can see that the zinc has doubled the effect compared to the silver uh, on the color uh, when we add a little amount of it to our composition. For the A color um, coordinate, which I, which as you can remember, represent the difference in hue between the green and the red color, you can see that as the silver and double zinc concentration, so following the same um, trick we used before, uh, we have again a good correlation uh, with the A color coordinate, we tend to decrease and going toward uh, the green hue. Um, for the B color coordinate, again, we get a very uh, similar effect, a very uh, good correlation in which uh, the B color coordinate tends to increase with the silver and zinc content, shifting from a, a blue toward a, a yellow hue of the material. We will now uh, talk about hardness and how the hardness vary uh, based on the silver concentration. This is uh, an important topic because it's related to, um, um, to uh, the uh, chemical and physical transformation inside of the material. As you can see, the uh, solubilization, the hardness after solubilization, which is represented by the square dots and the blue line, and the um, hardness after hardening proce uh, process, which is represented by the red line and the triangle dots, uh, tends both to increase with the silver concentration, but do it only in a significant uh, matter after an amount of silver content, uh, or, or when the silver content is higher than 6 to 7.5% in the uh, alloy, which means that the hardening uh, mechanism is uh, um, dependent on the silver inside of the alloy. This is different if you com it is a different behavior if you compare it to 18 carat um, gold alloy, uh, which were explained uh, the last week in a previous presentation. Uh, in 18 carat uh, um, gold alloy, the hardening mechanism is due to order disorder transition and is correlated to the copper content. In 14 carat, the mechanism is due to precipitation of a second silver rich phase against a first homogeneous phase, which is uh, formed during uh, solidification. So it has to, um, the silver has to be present for this mechanism to happen. Um, so again, minimum concentration of silver 7.5% and then we have a very good hardening. If we were in this graph to isolate uh, the data corresponding to uh, alloy with the same content of, zinc, uh, of silver but different content of zinc, we will see that uh, the alloy with more zinc we will, be, uh, will be a little le less hard.
we took uh, of uh, grain size now you can see in this graph uh, all the grain size of our set of data uh, against the silver concentration as you can see there is no clear correlation or uh, between grain size and silver concentration in fact, uh, it seems that uh, the grain uh, size of uh, the alloy is completely independent from the silver concentration of the alloy itself. And instead, there is uh, um, the, the behavior of the alloy is determined by the secondary addition of elements. So the grain refiner or the, the oxidizer element, this part, of data is uh, comprised of alloy we, we, which all contains the GR1 grain refiner, so the platinoid group grain refiner, uh, which gives the alloy a very fine grain. In this area, we can see the alloy which contains the second kind of grain refiner, so the GR2, uh, which is uh, um, cobalt uh, basically and uh, it's a grain refiner which work uh, not too well when we go from liquid to solid phase but work uh, uh, pretty well when you uh, when you try to make a thermal treatment of an already solid material so when you go recrystallize uh, the material in this part of the graph, we see uh, the, all the alloy which does not contain, which do not contain a grain refiner, but do contain a deoxidizer, um, and so have the largest uh, grain uh, dimension. We will now go uh, on considering the mechanical characteristic of the alloy. So in this graph, you can see both the ultimate uh, tensile strength, square dot and red line, and the yield strength, triangle dot and blue line, represented uh, against versus silver concentration. For the 11 alloy with uh, the oxidizer, so the alloy which uh, are used in investment casting, we will make uh, a distinction between the alloy uh, used in investment casting and the alloy used in uh, the formation. The, both the ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength tend to increase with the silver content, um, as you can see in the figure. If we were again to take in consideration uh, the data for alloy with the same silver content but different zinc content, we will see that the zinc instead tend to de decrease both the values. The elongation at the breaking point uh, on the opposite, uh, it behaves uh, differently. As the silver concentration of the alloy increases, the elongation tends to decrease. Um, while uh, if we were to uh, again consider the zinc concentration, we will see that the behavior will be the opposite. So as the zinc concentration increase, the elongation increase too. If we now consider uh, the 21 uh, of uh, alloy with contain grain refiner, so the alloy used in uh, plastic deformation, we can see that the trend are very similar, but the value are much higher. So the grain refiner uh, used in this alloy helps out into increasing both this value. The um, trend, uh, depending on the silver concentration, uh, instead remain the same with both the um, ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength that tend to increase with the silver content or decrease with the zinc content. We can also make an additional consideration uh, since we have uh, many, many data in this plot, which is uh, alloy with the GR1 grain refiner. So the alloy uh, with the platinoid group grain refiner have a uh, 
um, higher tensile and yield strength compared to the alloy, which do contain the other grain refiner, the GR2. As in the previous uh, set of data, um, the elongation follow the same behavior. So uh, as the silver concentration inside uh, increases, the elongation decreases, uh, while uh, for the zinc, the behavior is opposite. So for the zinc concentration increase, the uh, elongation increase too. And we now consider the Ericsson value. What's the Ericsson value? Is a, a, a value uh, correlated to the capability of the material to be used in stampato production. So um, the capability of the material of be uh, deformed in this uh, specific case, in this specific test by a sphere uh, without uh, uh, cracking. Uh, the higher the Ericsson value, the higher the material can be deformed before breaking. We can see that uh, for, the, for a silver content which increases inside of the alloy, the Ericsson value, so the capability of material to be deformed, actually uh, decreases. Um, the, <clears throat> the um, behavior uh, according versus the zinc concentration instead tell us that the Harrison value increase as the zinc concentration increased too. If we were to take uh, in consideration only alloy which has the same content of both silver and zinc, we will see that the Ericsson value will increase as the grain size increases. So a bigger grain size is actually better uh, from the Ericsson value point of view. The last uh, set of data, we will be having a look of it uh, for the yellow uh, carat gold, yellow 14 carat gold, is the hardness during cold working. Uh, in this graph, you can see the hardness versus the thickness reduction, so the, the amount of plastic uh, deformation you do on the alloy for a representative uh, subset of data with an increasing in the uh, silver content. The alloy with uh, higher silver content has the higher hardness both at 0% uh, of deformation and both at 90% deformation. And even if you can see that uh, while the uh, deformation increases, so the material is worked on, the difference in hardness between uh, the higher content, uh, the higher silver content alloy and the lower silver content alloy uh, become less and less. We will now start considering the uh, 40 carat red gold alloy. For this uh, um, set of data, we will examine 18 alloys. So again, gold concentration is 58.5%. Silver concentration is clearly less to be able to give uh, the red color. So from 0.6 to 13.3% of silver, and the zinc concentration is uh, less to from 0.5% to 2.5%. Again, we will have some alloy which contain two kinds of grain refiner, GR1 and GR2, uh, with the same specification of before, and some alloy will contain the oxidizer element. We will follow the same pattern of, uh, the, of test made for the uh, yellow uh, color. So, we will start with liquidus and solidus temperatures. Again, you see that uh, both the liquidus, red line, and the solidus, the blue line, tends to decrease with the silver concentration. Uh, we have no um, turning point and uh, second increase of, uh, of the values like we had in the yellow gold because uh, we cannot reach that content of silver. 
the maximum silver content is 13.5 or we would have a, a yellow and no more a red uh, color so uh, about the temperature tend to decrease with the silver concentration and the melting range tend to increase so the distance between the liquidus and the solidus tend to increase with the um, silver concentration. Unfortunately, we have no uh, sufficient data to uh, describe the behavior uh, according to zinc. The density, again, uh, is a very, has a very good correlation. There's a very good correlation between density and silver concentration. We see that the, um, we have a, a linear correlation uh, for as the silver concentration increases, uh, the density increases too. We will now uh, begin work on the uh, color coordinate like we did with the yellow gold. So we will start with the L uh, color coordinate, so the brightness coordinate. Uh, again, we can see uh, a tendency. We can see that as the silver concentration increases, uh, the L color coordinate increases too. But there is no precise correlation, no uh, law, no rule. Um, if we were to use the same trick we use for the yellow gold, so try to uh, put the same uh, data of color coordinate against the silver two times the zinc concentration, we will see that the correlation um, improve a little bit, but the data has still a certain amount of dispersion. So uh, this rule, at least for the uh, L coordinate, uh, is not always uh, useful. You can see but the same rule is instead very useful for what uh, for the A color coordinate and the B color coordinate. You, you can see here the A color coordinate, so the uh, green to red hue of the color, which tend to decrease, so the color tend to shift toward the green when the silver and the zinc content increase. And in a Similar way, we have a very good correlation for the B color coordinate and the silver to two times zinc concentration uh, with the color, um, with the B color coordinate, which tend to increase uh, shifting the color from blue toward yellow. Cool. The hardness. You can see uh, with the same uh, rule of before, so uh, square uh, dot and blue line is the hardness after solubilization, and triangle dot and the red line uh, represent uh, the hardness after hardening. Uh, you can see again that uh, we have a good hardening but only after the silver concentration uh, in the alloy is uh, increased over 7.5%. Uh, the mechanism is the same as before, so we have a silver rich phase uh, which precipitate uh, during solidification, and so the, the consideration are the same as before. I will take my time to explain you that this is a very uh, peculiar uh, situation because in this case the color is red, which means that a 7.5% uh, silver inside a uh, red gold means the color is not so reddish. We have a bright or clear red, uh, a pink. This kind of color can be hardened. If I were to make a very reddish color, a very uh, intense red color uh, with a low amount of silver, low amount of zinc, we will have no hardening because there is no, the, 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 the silver rich phase cannot precipitate because we have no silver rich phase. So this is important. If you want a very 
uh, strong red, you cannot have a hardening, a age hardening process. In this graph, we can see the grain size of uh, all, the, all this set of data uh, compared to uh, against the silver concentration. Like uh, in the uh, yellow, the 40 card yellow gold, we see that the silver concentration uh, seems not to influence the grain size of uh, the alloy. Um, the grain size is instead determined by the addiction of secondary element like before. So in this area, we can see the grain size of alloy which contain the GR1 grain refiner, the platinoid group grain refiner. So very fine grain for these alloys. And in this area, we can see the alloys which, are, which contain the GR2 grain refiner. So again, a grain refiner which work uh, better uh, after recrystallization uh, and not after solidification. And here we can see the, the data for the alloy, which, that, which do not contain uh, a grain refiner, but only have the oxidizer. So the behavior is exactly the same um, uh, for uh, red, for the 40 card red gold alloys and the 40 card yellow gold alloys. We'll now start considering the mechanical characteristic. First, for the investment casting alloy, we, take a, we took a selection of uh, 12 alloy uh, used in investment casting, and we can see, again, the ultimate tensile strength in red and, and square dots, and the yield strength in triangle dots and blue line. Um, as in the uh, yellow color, both the ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength tend to increase with the silver concentration. Um, the yield strength in a, uh, is more influenced, so it varies uh, a lot, while the uh, ultimate tensile strength uh, varies uh, very little between alloy which lower and higher silver content. Um, if we separate uh, the investment casting alloy containing only a grain refiner and the investment casting alloy containing a grain refiner and a deoxidizer, we will see that the trend is the same. But the alloy which contain the, the oxidizer element have the uh, absolute value for the ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength uh, a little uh, lower. The elongation follow the same rule of the yellow gold. So as the silver concentration increase in the alloy, the elongation tend to decrease. Um, for uh, investment casting alloys, which contain also uh, the oxidizer element, the absolute value is a little lower, but the trend is the same. If we now take in consideration the alloy which only contain grain refiner, we can see that we have uh, the same trend. So again, ultimate tensile strength and yield strength tend to increase with the silver concentration. The yield strength in a bigger way uh, compared to the ultimate tensile strength. And again, the elongation uh, tends to uh, decrease with the silver concentration, but not following any uh, precise uh, correlation uh, differently from before. So you see there is a lot of uh, data dispersion. For what it concerns, the Ericsson value, so again, the, uh, how much the material can be uh, deformed before uh, cracking by a, a sphere, an object we take on its surface, uh, we can see that the Ericsson value tend to decrease with the silver concentration, but not following, even in this case, uh, a precise rule, so there is no clear correlation. We can obtain 
a better correlation if we consider only a part of all of our data, only the alloy uh, which contain uh, the GR1 grain refiner. In this case, the correlation is much better and we can see what we already uh, saw before. So that as the silver concentration increases, the uh, drawability of the material, so the Rx value, tend to decrease. At last, we will consider the cold working hardness as for the yellow uh, gold. So again, in this graph, you can see the, uh, the hardness uh, versus uh, the, tax, uh, the thickness reduction, so the, um, the amount of plastic uh, the formation we made on the material. And you see a, a subset of data uh, in which the silver content vary. So for the alloy with higher silver, uh, you can see that the hardness is higher and it stay higher even at the 90% um, of reduction, while alloys uh, which contain less silver have uh, less uh, hardness and even when cold worked have less hardness even if the difference between uh, lower content of silver and higher content of silver tend to decrease as the cold working uh, gone and this uh, conclude our uh, characterization for both the 40 carat yellow gold and 40 carat uh, uh, red gold. We believe that uh, in this work we have identified in most cases the correlation between the chemical and mechanical properties of the material and the composition of the material. Uh, this means that in many cases uh, uh, we can deduce the composition required to have uh, uh, specific characteristics or specific behavior uh, according to what the, the customer uh, require us and this also uh, show how important uh, is uh, uh, for each company to um, collect uh, all the data of their characterization all the data they can uh, measure um, during their uh, their time into working because it is uh, allow is allow uh, the company to uh, reach um, some consideration to make some consideration and uh, uh, sometimes even some discovery uh, even before uh, have to uh, do some er experimental trial um, and I think that's all for this work so I thank you every one of you for your attention and I remain at my disposal at your disposal for any question on the presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Valerio. Um, good presentation and also on time, so very good. You, you declare 45 minutes and you went with 45 minutes, so very good. So now I think that we can go with the question section and we can start with the, I remind you, as you can see in the last slide that there are our email address, Valerio one and mine as well. So for any information, any further information you need, please feel free to write us anytime and we will be happy in case in next days to deeply answer you. By the way, we can start with the current question. Okay, um, uh, Valerio, there is Kevin that, that would like to know uh, which kind of grain refiner uh, uh, we use in this kind of job. I mean, you were mentioning GR1 and GR2, so if we can disclose understanding what are uh, these okay. grain refiners? So G, uh, GR1 is a grain refiner of the platinoid uh, group. I'm not sure we can <laughs> disclose the exact... Uh, okay, the I think one, no but, big secret. Big yeah, secret. but it's a part of the platinoid group. So it's a classical grain refiner. Many, many, okay. you see many companies using uh, this kind. The GR2, so the grain refiner which I mentioned, uh, works better. Um, from the solid state, so from a, um, when we do a recrystallization of an already solid material, and not when we start from a liquid and we go to solid phase, uh, it's cobalt. That's not that's no secret. It's used in uh, uh, many 
um, many uh, bronze uh, alloys and other composition like that. So, in Mark, uh, uh, would like to know at the end if checking the gr uh, Grand Refiner 2 and Grand Refiner uh, 1, yeah. he would like to understand which difference because he's seeing some slide the difference in the behavior. So, if you can explain why they behave in different way, if there's a specific reason why. Uh, it's all a matter in this case, and let's see if I can. Okay, this for example, is all a matter of the uh, mechanism behind of the material and in particular of the solubility of the material uh, inside of the, the matrix. So, uh, grain refiner GR1 uh, have a low solubility in uh, uh, gold and uh, uh, in uh, other precious uh, metals. So, uh, when the, the alloy uh, is solidifying, it tends to create a lot of nucleation centers. Uh, the cobalt is, uh, has an intermediate behavior. Uh, if you go and look to the phase diagram, uh, you can see that there is clearly a difference in behavior um, and in uh, phase and in precipitate it creates. It's a big question. We can, uh, I, I can talk uh, to you uh, uh, if you want. Uh, we can talk uh, in, uh, in person. But basically, it's uh, um, all to the combination of solubility between the grain refiner and uh, the component of the alloy. Uh, if we were to use the same grain refiner in an alloy with a different composition, it is not, uh, uh, we could have different results because. Uh, the, the solubility can uh, vary. Uh. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Sergio <clears throat> is giving, uh, let's say, a simple question, but also very difficult. Okay, so yeah, okay. Uh, you would say that using uh, grain refiner one alloys is the best, best option nowadays? Um, in this set of data, for this subset of data, we can say that the grain refiner one uh, had the best results from a mechanical point of view. Exactly. Uh, things like color density and are not influenced by the grain refiner used. And the grain refiner can have also a, an economical impact on the cost of the alloy. So it really depends on what the application is. It really worth your application? I mean, if you have to do uh, investment casting, it could be that there is uh, more room toward using something uh, without grain refiner. Uh, Sergio is giving me a uh, correction. I mean, just telling that he was mentioning about uh, uh, casting, maybe casting. He's talking about casting. So if in casting process is, is the best solution, if there is something better, I can add something if you want also later, Valeria. Oh, you yeah, can. if you have a personal experience on the matter, I will say that uh, the, between the, grain, the, the two groups of grain refiners, so if you, if you want, between the grain refiner of the GR1 group, uh, so platinoid group elements, and the grain refiner so sure of the GR2 are sure better <laughs> than GR1. And um, then the, the question again, uh, go on, uh, is it uh, needed, the wind refiner in uh, investment casting? If you made a material which have a uh, strong uh, tension, for, depending on how the, the shape of these exactly. pieces are put on the, the casting tree, yes, it, it really help out. Uh, if you have a very simple shapes and no problem of, uh, um, tension during solidification, during uh, quenching of the, of the flask, then maybe you could think of using an alloy with a deoxidizer to give you a better result of the surface and no grain refiner. You want to add something, uh, Stefano? Yeah, yeah, I would say that that's, that's why I was telling that this is a little bit complicated and difficult question because at the end, the reality is always that it depends in what a, a, is somebody is one of doing, for example, very simple. If I want to take care about gas porosity, for example, which is common defect, maybe it would be better using silicon alloy. Why, if I want to take care about shrinkage porosity, maybe it would be better using alloy with grain refiner. For sure, I think that the group, the 
GR1 is better than GR2. Uh, but in any case, uh, it depends always in what uh, is anybody doing and willing to do. So that's why I, w I would say that there is never an official answer in what is the best alloy to use, but it's depending every time in what everybody needs in the specific case. Yeah, red color and 40 carat in particular because the carotage is lower, so you can have a, a more reaction and the red color, so the, the, the rich amount of copper can do every sort of phenomena. So we have to examine case by case in this, yes, yes. this situation. Okay, uh, Mr. Murtuza is asking if the grain size of, uh, of the alloy can have an effect on the final color. Uh, no, we can. Um, there was some hypothesis uh, uh, about uh, uh, a finer grain giving you a better brightness, uh, but the general color is not influenced uh, by the grain dimension. Sorry. So, in fact, okay. we 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 showed the color uh, before. Uh, in, in a part of the, the work uh, which uh, uh, still uh, didn't, di did not uh, divide the alloy between investment casting and plastic deformation. Okay, uh, Kevin is asking uh, if you can explain generally the principle of age hardening for increasing the hardness of the alloy. You, you said something, if you can maybe say. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. So again, this is a very, um, huge uh, okay. question uh, to explain uh, but uh, the the principle is in 40 karat again uh, we are talking about 40 karat 80 karat have a completely different uh, chemical mechanism uh, um, if you go follow the the previous uh, um, uh, webinar which was uh, by uh, my colleague uh, Elias Sacardo uh, he talked about uh, the mechanism for 80 carat. For 40 carat, uh, again, I will find the slide. Uh, yeah, 40 carat, what happened? Uh, that when the material, uh, when the alloy go from liquid to solid, first a uh, homogeneous phase is formed. As the temperature decreases again, uh, a second phase so in a, in a homogeneous matrix a second phase start appearing uh, in a small area and it is a phase very rich in silver and uh, the presence of this second phase inside of the uh, first homogeneous uh, phase is what gives the material a higher hardness because um, the it go um, uh, blocking uh, it go it it, uh, um, it slow down the capability of the material to uh, the, the 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 capability of the formation of the material. So yes, um, I think I I could give you some uh, I could send you some material uh, about the chemistry of it, but. Again, uh, you can explain all these phenomena based on the phase diagram. When you're following um, uh, composition uh, in the phase diagram uh, from the liquid to the solid state, you see that different uh, phases are, are created. So the hardness here is due to the presence of second phase inside a uh, first homogeneous matrix of first phase. Okay, uh, so Marco is asking uh, Valerio, when do we annealing and age hardening in uh, 14 yeah. carat white gold? What should be the quenching time? Should be quenching in water immediately or we have to wait for some time? And also during the annealing process, do you suggest to use water? So uh, the question was about uh, white gold from annealing and age hardening, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, usually, uh, you quench the material in solidification from the liquid phase uh, when you go uh, make a thermal treatment after 
ah, okay, okay, I understand maybe the question now. The quenching after the annealing. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, it depends a little on how much, uh, how is the content, I think it's a nickel alloy he was mentioning. Or Sorry, right? Valerio. Is a nickel alloy we are talking about? He didn't specify, but yes, like consider it is a nickel based alloy. Yeah, I, I think uh, for a, a nickel based alloy, it depends on the nickel content. And again, yes, uh, nickel uh, base, you're saying. Yeah. Yes. So we, it, it depends on the nickel content. Uh, usually, after annealing, uh, you try to go quenching uh, immediately. Uh, or, the, or the microstructure is not. Uh, is not uh, um, Formed uh, in a good way, but uh, uh, for some composition, uh, both in red and in white gold, uh, depending on the the amount of elements inside, it can be problematic, and we usually suggest uh, some trick to try to uh, to first um, um, cool down a little bit of the piece and then go quenching. So. Uh, we should need uh, more data probably on the matter and the nickel content and the kind of pieces. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, after annealing, uh, you go quenching immediately. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, Mortuza is giving this question, Valerio, yeah. for the age of adenine. Is it necessary to use a very precise temperature control furnace? So if temperature is set at 300 Celsius and it varies between 275 to 325, we give it proper hardening results. So it's going to change in something if you don't respect in a precise way the temperature or if there are some variable. Okay, the, the material, uh, if you re uh, reach the, the minimum hardening, uh, uh, if you give them um, the, the energy, to the alloy uh, by both uh, temperature and time, the hardening will happen. Uh, if we have uh, a small uh, difference between the, uh, the temperature we go to use and the temperature uh, which was uh, required by the alloy, we could obtain a little a hardness, a little lower than the maximum amount, but the hardening uh, in general, should always happen uh, if we, uh, I mean, if it, we don't go 100 <laughs> Celsius degree. <laughs> but, okay, okay. Matusa is still asking also if some yeah. alloys are meant for 18 carat to 14 carat and some other for 9 carat to 14 carat. Yeah. If one has to work particularly for 14 carat mechanical only, which group of alloy would be more suitable? Uh, okay, uh, I, I try to answer, okay, okay. Valerio. Yeah. Um, I think that usually, usually uh, the alloy in low carat, usually in our family are suitable from low carat, let's say from 9 to uh, 14K, while uh, the 18 ones, the 18 ones are specific for 18 ones. It's more difficult to use something which is available in 18 to move in lower carat. There are some specific cases you can. Uh, of course, uh, also here we have in Italy, we use a kind of joke, okay, that we used to say that you cannot have your, your wife which is drunk and the bottle of wine uh, full. Because sometimes it depends on what you want. I mean, if you want uh, something general, you can accept a compromise, okay. But if you want something specific and if you get want to get the best result, maybe you have to choose. So uh, you can find alloys that generally can be available for all the fineness. Okay, but the result maybe won't be perfect. If you want to go deeper, maybe it is better that you use something uh, specific for that specific uh, fineness. But usually the range is moving from 9 till 14K. Usually one alloy which is good in 9 can work also in 14K. And 18 is, let's say, another kind of group. Okay, I hope okay. that I answer you. I mean, the magic word here is it can work. So uh, there, there are alloys which can work at all uh, the fineness, but maybe work best in one of the fineness. Exactly. But exactly. it really depends on the composition again. So 
giving a general uh, also 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 for color yeah. uh -huh. also the color yeah, is going to yeah, change yeah. in completely just the same alloy using different finance the color uh, can change so what maybe you like in 18 carat uh, you you will hate or you won't like in, in in another carat so that's why there are many things that we have always to consider um, so mr punit uh, valeri yeah. is asking how much is increasing it's the maximum increased hardness in 14k uh, if you have a range in uh, during age hardening treatment, yeah, for the um, well, we have the data <laughs> on display for red or uh, yellow. He's, he's asking 14k yellow. 14k yellow. So if I'm not wrong, this is uh, the slide about it. So as you can see, for the the data we had at our disposal, so for our alloy, the hardness went uh, between. Uh, uh, 250 and 270 vickers uh, if we have a good silver concentration so uh, around 80 to uh, 25 percent of silver if we have lower amount of silver you can see the, the data here the maximum hardness tend to decrease a little bit okay um, okay, Martuz is asking if there's any difference in result if annealing is done or not before age hardening. Is going to change in something if you don't do? Uh, ah, if you don't do the uh, annealing before the age hardening. Yes. Um, okay, uh, usually the best result for hardness uh, only uh, happen uh, after a proper annealing. Uh, we don't have any. Uh, technical data on the matter as uh, in this work uh, the sequence of operation was all done uh, by following the annealing and then hardening process by laboratory experience uh, I can tell you that uh, um, you never reach uh, the, the maximum hardness value if you don't do a uh, good annealing beforehand you can uh, if you do a very good uh, quenching a very quick quenching after casting but mm, the better result is always after making annealing okay and <clears throat> mr kevin is asking what are the parameters used for do uh, doing age hardening in terms of temperature and time if you can say something in general uh, something general we go from uh, 250 to 350 celsius degree for um, usually from uh, one to two hours, sometimes three, it depends on the composition. Uh, but these are the, 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 the let's say, the, the medium value from 250 to 350, uh, one, two hours. Okay, uh, Mr. Maesh is asking if 14K uh, stone in place casting, if, if stone in place casting is possible in 14K. Um, really, it doesn't depend on the alloy, it depends on the stones, <laughs> because the, the, the limit is uh, will the stones uh, crack when, uh, because of uh, the, the, uh, the alloy, the deformation of the alloy or because of the thermal treatment uh, necessary for the alloy. Uh, so the limit here is due to the stones, not to, to, the, uh, to the alloy. Okay, uh, Mr. Vagesam is asking that as in 14K without specifying the color, okay, just, yeah. just talking about 14 carat uh, yeah. gold, uh, the alloy percentage is higher uh, if we compare to 18K as well. Uh, I have heard a bit that it has an effect on the skin. If so, with reduction, which material content in can be minimized. So, uh, is, if there is a, if it is true that 14K is creating some more problem uh, than 18 on the skin, sure. and if yes, if it is due to some specific elements that we can reduce in case just to avoid. Okay. Um, so the um, surely when we go from 80 to 40 carat, the amount of uh, non-noble material inside of the alloy increase. So uh, the material is less protected. By the gold, which is noble and don't react with uh, anything. Uh, so yes, the 40 carat gold alloy are more uh, uh, subjected compared to 8 carat gold alloy 
to um, problems of uh, tarnishing, oxidation, uh, reaction with investment. Um, in particular, between all the elements, uh, I will say that the most problematic one is copper. Since the copper tends to react uh, a lot, um, particularly with the oxygen, so uh, um, except when you have sulfur, because sulfur, for example, is very aggressive against the silver. So, uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, the copper is the most problematic element. Uh, so, if you reduce copper, the result could be a little bit if you. Um, uh, not remove, sorry. If you go decreasing the copper amount, uh, the result should be a little better. But uh, it depends on what kind of uh, corrosion proce process we are talking about. And like the example I made, uh, tarnish, for example, is uh, strong versus silver. Uh, but in general, uh, yes, 40 carat is less resistant to some of this problem compared to 80 carat called alloys. Also, there is the last question from Chinta, which is asking, yeah. uh, which is more uh, preferable to use in investment casting with stone in place, uh, 14K red gold, a grain refining alloy or one with a deoxidizer inside? Whoa. <laughs> so this is that, that's uh, that's uh, that, that that's difficult. Uh, when you go when you work a stone in place, uh, you usually want a deoxidizer because you cannot afford to go uh, to go pickling uh, because it will uh, damage the stones. Um, yeah. So the problem is uh, is uh, due to that. So I, I'm not even sure we can uh, we have a space to discuss on that. Uh, if you want to use a grain refiner, clearly that could help, especially with the, 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 uh, the prompts uh, for the gems, uh, but you will uh, uh, renounce the, the oxidizer effect, so uh, you have a, a, an aspect of the casted tree which is uh, uh, a little worse, and uh, you have to be able to uh, clean the tree in a different way. Okay, okay, Valerio, thank you very much. It looks that there are no more uh, questions. Um, I, in, in, if some some of you wanna uh, ask something more, or you can do it. In the meantime, I would like to remind you that all this job uh, you are free to find in our website progold.com. Okay, in the webinar section you can download the video and also the uh, PowerPoint presentation of this speech, but also of the, all the previews. And also remind, um, giving you the reminder that next week uh, the next webinar will be very very interesting because we are going to talk in a very uh, crazy problem, which is tarnish phenomena in silver. So I hope uh, and I'm inviting you officially to join us next week. Uh, as you know already, okay, same, same time next Thursday will be the appointment at 4 p.m. chat. Um, so, okay, if there are no more questions, I think that we can uh, thank everybody. I want to personally thank you, uh, Valerio, for your presentation and mm -hmm. uh, thanking everybody to attend at this webinar, hoping that we answer and that you uh, found it interesting. Okay, so hoping to see you next week. Uh, I wish you uh, a good day and thank you very much to stay with us today. So take thank care you. and bye bye. See you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.